Hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Wills, your host. And tonight is a call-in show, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from you, our listeners. The show is about you, but before it's about you, it's uh, going to be about something else. And the reason I decided to do this is because uh, my brother-in-law um, was a nuclear scientist at Los Alamos Labs, a chemist, and um, the, a few days ago he said to me, wow, there really is something about this you know, UFOs and, and the government saying they're real and all that. Um, and so I said, what exactly did you see? And he talks about this video with a green background and um, this triangle. And I said, oh, yeah, that, that's the pyramid UFO. And uh, I said, uh, well, unfortunately, I, I think I think it's uh, I think it's nothing. And he's like, no, no, finally, I believe you. And <laughs> that uh, because I do the show on UFOs and he said, I, I think this might be something to this. You can tell me it's nothing, but that's not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. There's a, plenty of things that are uh, very authentic out there and very interesting and unexplainable. That's all out there. So uh, I have Mick West. He has the uh, website Metabunk um, because I watched his video and I believe uh, in what he uh, is saying this thing is. I think that's the most likely uh, uh cause of what did this, all what he'll be talking about. He has a video up, but what we're going to be doing is um, I'm going to be playing the video part of that. And uh, and he and I will be talking, mostly him, he's going to narrate uh, what we're seeing in this video. And for those of you uh, that are listening to the audio podcast, if you go to the show, na- show notes, you will see this uh, video up there. So you're welcome to watch it that way. It's It's too hard to explain any other way than watching it by video when when he does that. Um, so I earlier this morning, I happened to listen to an interview. Uh, thanks to Phil that uh, turned me on to this interview with the Black Vault. I do watch a lot of uh, John Greenwald's great work. And he had uh, Mick, uh, the, the guest today in a minute, Mick West. And he also had Robert Powell on. And uh, during the interview, I had like a couple of thoughts popped up in my head and that I wish... I could have interjected. I thought uh, John did a, an amazing job. He let them talk. Uh, he just moderated a little bit and did a wonderful job. Um, so anyway, that's on the Black Vault uh, in YouTube. Uh, and I suggest uh, if you're interested, check that out. Uh, there's a lot of other great ones by him as well. So anyway, um, I couldn't interject anything, but I have the next best thing. And that is I spoke with Kevin Day, um, who is directly involved uh, with the Nimitz a case, which is what? John Greenwald um, uh, interviewed them out about Robert Powell and Mick West, mostly about. Of course, we're not going to really be talking about that um, tonight, but we will after the video plays with Kevin Day and I discussing uh, some of the questions that I had and hearing it from Kevin Day. Then I would like to get um, I would get the like to get the feedback um, from Mick West after uh, he listens to what Kevin Day had to say. One of the things I do want to point out was. Uh, When I said to Kevin Day that I'm going to be speaking with Mick West, uh, Kevin said to me, he said, treat him with respect and uh, don't try to make a clown out of him and uh, listen to his points. And I thought that was very honorable of Kevin Day. It kind of speaks to Kevin Day's character, if you ask me. So uh, last Saturday on the 24th, I was part of this thing called the Big Phone Home, and that is for um, activists uh, to actually get involved uh, with uh, Congress, I mean, the uh, Intelligence um, Committee about UAP studies to get some more information. And um, it was a big, huge success. Of, uh, I thought it went really well. Now, Luis Jimenez came kind of out of nowhere, and he did a wonderful job. I was actually the first UFO guy that he ever interviewed. So uh, anyway, he's a lot of fun, too. So you can still get involved with that at any time uh, up until the end. And just go to thebigphonehome.com, and all that information is there. Next week, on the premiere night of the History Channel's Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, we have uh, Travis Taylor from the show and Brandon Fugel, the owner of the Skinwalker Ranch. They're going to be on for about, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes, something like that. And then the main guest is Mark Florentino, and he has a book. Um, he's an author of the uh, book, The Master of Reality. And uh, I know UFOs are in there somewhere. 
Um, but anyway, I can't think of exactly why they're tied in. But right now I'm bringing in um, the guest for right now. And remember, after this, after Mick goes away, the lines will be open. I'll be bringing Bill in and we'll be uh, working all that stuff out. So for right now, here's Mick. How you doing, Mick? I'm glad to be here, Martin. Yes, thank you. You may want to uh, just up your volume just a little bit. It's, you seem a little tad quiet. And okay. um, but so I don't know if you want to just jump right in and do this video right now, sure. and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So here we go. Uh, Whoops. I thought here we go. Okay, Doug. So here we see a flashing green triangle. Uh, the first thing that I noticed really was actually the flashing, and it kind of reminded me of a uh, the the rate that uh, a plane flashes at. So uh, what I did was try to figure out why that would be. And uh, one thing that kind of cropped up is these things we just showed, which are cameras which have triangular apertures. And if you look at stars or planes through them and they're a bit out of focus, then the triangular aperture makes the images look like they are uh, triangular. And if you look at the, tra the traffic in that uh, area at the time, there was planes flying overhead. And if you compare footage that was taken with a night vision camera with a uh, triangular aperture on the right here with the, uh, with the Corbell footage, it shows us triangular. And the lights of the stars we can match to existing stars, uh, stars which are like Jupiter and Antares, uh, two uh, very noticeable stars and the other stars around them. We can then pan across and uh, uh, see that the flashing plane looks the same as one of those stars, so there's no real difference there between what it looks like at the start. And then later on we see it uh, fly past a couple of other stars uh, in the sky and we notice that it, those stars are also triangular. And uh, the... Uh, kind of leads you to the fairly obvious conclusion, I think, that what we're seeing here is a plane that is uh, out of focus, and we're just seeing the point lights on that plane flashing, just like FAA uh, regulations do. Uh, and uh, what we see here on, on the right here is, uh, uh, is footage taken with a night vision camera showing the exact same thing. This is a night vision camera. Sometimes they have triangular apertures, uh, uh, sometimes uh, people put tape over the front of their night vision cameras to, uh, this is something they actually do to increase the, the, uh, the, the focus. And this makes things turn into, into triangles. And in this case, it would be a square, but you know, you could, you could envision someone doing a, a triangular taping. I don't think it is actually a triangular taped camera, much more likely it's something like an actual night vision camera like this that has a built-in aperture, which is triangular. Uh, you can see here. They call it like the iris, right? Yeah, the iris. Uh, yeah, there's mm -hmm. another name for, for, the, for the adjustable aperture that they have. And you can use that. And a friend of mine took this camera and filmed the night sky and basically got the exact same footage as we have in the pyramid uh, video from Jeremy Corbell, uh, even with like flashing lights and the, the other stars around it looking triangular and dim. This was repeated again by someone else who took a, a military standard PVS-14 uh, night vision binocular and put a bit of tape over the front and did the exact same thing and got the exact same effect. And you notice that the the video looks really, really similar to, to the video we see of the supposed uh, pyramid UFO, even down to it having a circular highlight around the triangle, which some people pointed out as being evidence that the triangle was the real shape. But this right here is just the shape from the... Uh, triangular aperture so everything uh, everything kind of lines up with this hypothesis that it's just a person using their night vision monocular probably standing watch and maybe they had it focused a bit closer so that they were looking at something on deck or in the water then they see jupiter off in the distance they look at that uh, and then they pan over and they, they see they see a plane uh, because they're not zoomed in they're actually they're actually filming it with an iphone uh, yes, they're filming it f with an iPhone through the um, the PVS dash mm -hmm. fourteen NVGS or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Through that lens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what you're seeing isn't really like being recorded with military military hardware. It's recorded by somebody f holding up his phone to the back of one of these 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 cameras, which is exactly the same as the footage I duplicated, and you get the exact same effect with the. Uh, uh, the stars showing up as faint dots and uh, uh, brighter stars and planets showing up as, as bigger dots, well, not dots, as triangles. And it's all explainable by the, the aperture of the camera. So I don't think it really took very much for this, this to happen uh, originally. I think, um, like I said, it's probably just one person's mistake 
in that they just simply did not realize that the focus was a little bit off. Now, if you notice mm -hmm. at the start of the video, you saw these, these, these stars and the planet Jupiter, and they're in a very, they're in a very specific formation. And you can use that to, to see, you know, exactly kind of, uh, actually more or less what time it was. And it matches up with where Jupiter was at around nine o'clock or nine 30 on the evening of, uh, July the 14th or 15th, uh, mm -hmm. of 2019, which is the time of this, this incident of a kind of a swarm of, uh, drone spottings going on around the, uh, the USS Kidd and other ships, including the Russell, which is where this one was supposedly taken. So, so was when, this, was, was this video actually take shot from the ground? This video uh, looks like it was taken from uh, kind of the crow's nest area of the Russell. Oh, and you can kind of see oh, that. Oh, out on, this is out on the water. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, that's yeah. right. Sorry yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, this is out on the water. <laughs> and uh, it's, you can kind of see one of the uh, antennas, which you see at the ends of this. There's two kind of crow's nests, the most like crow's nests, the more kind of like uh, walkways on the upper levels of the ship. And it's yeah. kind of someone's on watch there uh, with their night vision binocular. And it's not focused at infinity, which it would need to be to resolve these, these stars and the planes at 30,000 feet. Um, and, and they just basically didn't realize that it was out of focus. And I think if it did come at the same time as all these other sightings of, of, of drones, uh, potential drones that were going on, then this guy may well have been uh, looking specifically for that type of thing. And so mm -hmm. when he's using his night vision and he looks and he sees this thing and he, he kind of zooms in by you know spreading his uh, his his iPhone zoom or whatever whatever phone it was, then he sees it what looks like to him to be a triangular drone, and he interprets it as such. And because he's thinking, oh, triangular drone, he's thinking, well, it must be like it's about you know seven hundred feet or so or a thousand feet. Uh, but if it was actually in focus he would have seen that it was just the flashing lights of an airplane and probably one at 30,000 feet and probably one of the ones that we saw flying over in the uh, uh, the flight radar uh, recreation before. Yeah. Um, the first thing I thought of when I very first saw it instantly was the lights, the way they were flashing, looked, looked like a jet to me of some kind. I mean, yeah. uh, right off the bat, the, I mean, they're flashing in a pattern that you see when you're watching planes fly and that that right off the bat made me think hmm um but um i i don't have any expertise in this this type of thing but um also i i, I would like to clear up that about what the government said or did not say they did not say that this was extraterrestrial they thought it was um a ufo but they said the the video was real or how exactly did that they said uh, in a statement by susan goff that the video was recorded by Navy personnel. That's right. And that it yeah. was included in the UAP task force, uh, I think make considerations or studies or something like that, but basically that they had looked at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she went on to say that, uh, uh, you know, she clarified, I think in other emails that it didn't mean uh, that it was currently unidentified and the UAP task force studies things that were reported as unidentified aerial phenomena at the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. just, just because something was unidentified at the time, which it was, you know, this guy thought he saw a flying triangle, it, uh, that's still something that a UAP task force has to look at because part of the problem of UAPs uh, are these kind of false positives or false negatives, depending which way you look at it, yeah. where people are unable to identify something. So that was an issue and something mm -hmm. that the task force would have looked at doesn't mean it's, uh, an actual flying pyramid because of that. It just means it was originally unidentified. Yeah. Um, people are looking at this that hadn't looked at other things and now they're going to be disappointed um, because they think it's uh, nothing and they were led astray. It's almost like a, a perfect disinformation sort of situation where um, everybody says, hey, look, hey, look, and then it's nothing. And then, okay, well, I'm not going to look next time. You know, that type of thing. It's very effective, in it, whether it's intentional or not. Um, that's how it could end up, you know, and, it's, it's, and we don't need another black eye in the UFO con community for sure. We've had enough and um, and uh, we seem to be going in a good direction. And uh, things like this can only um, hold us back, in my opinion. Oh, I think that's one way of looking at it. But perhaps another way is uh, perhaps it will 
be useful in prompting the UFO community to to apply more rigor when it comes to mm -hmm. looking at these things. And so perhaps future uh, releases will be things that are more more thoroughly vetted before they are uh, announced to the media as being uh, you know, the, the greatest UFO sighting ever, which I, I think is something that Jeremy Cobell actually literally said a few times, that he thought this was the greatest UFO video of all time, <laughs> uh, when it, it may well yeah. turn out to be nothing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very unfortunate yeah. that people can rush forward into these things, and perhaps this might improve things in the future by, by making people take a bit more care and perhaps you know, uh, allowing a little bit of peer review uh, from the skeptical community on these claims before they are released. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think obviously people want to get things out. There's kind of like a, an, an understandable uh, sense of urgency when someone has something that's that's really uh, seems amazing to them. Uh, they, yeah. They'd prefer to just get it out. But really, it's better for everyone if more care is taken. And And this isn't me trying to suppress evidence or anything like that. You know, the the yeah. problem with the UFO community isn't really a lack of evidence. It's a it's a it's a plethora of poor evidence and a lack of good evidence. So if we can kind of filter out all the terrible evidence, then any good evidence that's in there uh, should rise to, rise to the top. Yeah, yeah, I, I I do agree with that. And you know, we we suffered with the Roswell slides. I don't know if you know about that. Yeah. You know, and that was that was another mess. We we don't need to keep doing these type of things, in my opinion. So I appreciate that. Now on to uh, the interview that I listened to about the Nimitz case with you and, and Robert Powell. I'd like to play this clip um, that Kevin Date uh, recorded with me earlier. He couldn't be here now, but he was able to record with me earlier and then get your feedback after it. And again, anybody can watch over at uh, John Greenwald's uh, The Black Vault over at YouTube the live stream with Robert Powell and Mick West um, debating the topic basically of the Nimitz and uh, mostly that. So here we go. All right. I'm on right now with Kevin Day out uh, on the West coast. So How are you doing, Kevin? I'm uh, doing really well. Thanks for being back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, going back, uh, we're going to talk quickly about one situation and that is I recently watched uh, Mick West and uh, with Robert Powell and I had some questions that came to mind, like if I was doing the interview, and I think John Greenwald did a great job, nothing about that. But um, the first thing that came to mind um, in the interview was uh, when Mick mentioned that um, he it was most likely an F-18 uh, that was the lock on, not, not the Tic Tac object that's been described by eyewitnesses. Um, so the first thing that came to mind is if it was indeed an F-18, 18 wouldn't that pilot in the f-18 craft all of a sudden realize that someone had a lock on nobody talked about that if i uh, assuming that he was indeed locked on he his all of his electronic warfare gear would be screaming at him be lit up like a christmas tree he would instantly know and he'd probably instantly maneuver to try to break the lock so they would try to break the lock and that was yeah. now if it was an enemy aircraft similar to an f-18 you know from china or russia or whatever a mig or whatever they're called today um wouldn't there be like an investigation right away like we got to find out what that is and is there a yeah. transponder is there a transponder involved in a situation like this absolutely um and if i could just explain a little bit about the timeline because that'll help understand the context of this whole thing sure we were scheduled to do our air defense exercise at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, I We've been watching these objects for several days. They're up at 80,000 feet. I thought they were bogus system errors, and our technicians were trying to figure out what the hell it was and why the system wasn't working right. And then all of a sudden, the morning of the 10th, when I was going to do this air defense exercise, a group of these were suddenly at 28,000 feet, tracking south, which was going to take them right through my airspace. So the moment that I had an aircraft available that launched off the Nimitz happened to be Commander Fravor's fast eagle flight. I convinced the Captain Smith, hey, sir, you know, we've been tracking these. You and I both thought they were bogus, um, but we really need to go check it out and find out if they're real or not. And he reluctantly agreed because he was assuming they were bogus. Or he told me later that maybe even uh, spontaneously forming ice from space. And so that's why they were coming from 80,000 feet. So anyway, um, we launched right at 10 and um, 
Commander Fravor has his intercept. We we watch him in a guy as this thing goes from 28,000 feet out of the surface. And um, we end up canceling the exercise because um, the moment that I became convinced it was real was when we had in the overhead speaker, all of a sudden Commander Fravor yells, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm engaged, I'm engaged, right at the merge plot, which is basically two objects in the same vertical piece of sky. And on the 2D display, it looks like one object. And the object that he was intercepted went from 28,000 down to the surface. And at that moment, we were convinced, hey, these are real objects. They're right in our airspace, or there soon will be. And we have to cancel this exercise. So that's what we did. We canceled the exercise. And then we continued after everyone had recovered on the ship. Um, we continued to track several more groups. And we became very curious. OK, what the hell are these objects? We know they're real now. We know they're right in our airspace. So Commander Underwood um, specifically launched back off the Nimitz. I think it was around 3 p.m. in the afternoon by then. And he was instructed by Commander Fravor, hey, make sure you take an airplane with a, a blow up and ready at FLIR system so you can record this thing. That was his mission. So he went up there and that's exactly what he did. And that's where the, the FLIR video came from. That was his recording. And oh, by the way, that object that he intercepted, our entire side of air, there are several watch stations on the other side of combat. And we are constantly hooking things, trying to determine what stuff is if we, if we don't know. So I've got at least five people doing this on this object. There's no... There's no electronic signals coming off of it, which there would be if it had been an FNA-18. And there was no uh, identification friend or foe coming off of it. No modes and codes. No modes 1, 2, 3, 4, or Charlie coming off the thing. Which wow. we yeah. definitely would have had if it was an FNA-18. And furthermore, there were no, there were no more FNA-18s airborne at that time. Because they'd, right. all, they'd all returned to the carrier earlier in the morning when we canceled the exercise. So... Nick, yeah. um, and maybe it's my fault. Maybe I confused him, but his timeline doesn't. The timeline itself does, does not support it. Nor, yeah. nor does um, the qualitative evidence that we experienced does not support that object being an F and eighteen. It would and, soon and be Santa Claus. Yeah, and wouldn't wouldn't the let's see the the pilot. There's a couple things more that I'd like to ask. I, I know I'm not keeping you here long, but uh, wouldn't the pilot like know right away if he locked onto an F-18. I mean, wouldn't it come up in that's, his own sensory absolutely, program? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he would, he, he would be getting ES from it, the same as us on the ship, electronic support signals. And he would also be getting IFF from it. He would, trust me, these guys know who their, their fellow wingmen are. We've been training for months, team training. This was, this was our final graduation exercise before deployment. Yeah. We were the, on the upper yeah. rung of training at this point. And, being able to identify our, our own assets is pretty much what everything else relies on top of. Right. Right. Especially when you have no business going overseas, you know, that's right. Yeah. Another, another quick thing. I know uh, I've heard someone else I spoke to talked about a, uh, a different type of video, a real clear, you know, high definition video. And I'm just wondering it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Why are they using all of this FLR and this other type of equipment when they could have just simply filmed it is was there a reason for that was it because they were trying to lock in to see exactly what it was well, and well his system has several different modes uh at FLIR being one of them but he also has ir mode and he has a, a, a television camera mode. actually was flipped in between all three of those modes during during this intercept and that's why you see the, the image it's kind of flickered and the the reason why that's grainy and that was another one of mixed um very valid points. Hey, why is this thing so clear when a multi-million dollar system filmed it? Well, that's true. It did. But that video, this is in 2004, remember, and was actually just a an MPEG video snippet of a much longer, much clearer video. And back in 2004, MPEG, um, well, let's just say it's better now than it was then, right? So right. in my mind, of course, it's grainy video. And it was grainy video in 2004, too, when I received it in my secret email the very next morning after the intercept happened. It's, and that's why when I saw it down at the golf course, I was carrying out. I had just reopened the kitchen. I had forgotten all about this. I moved on with my life. And all of a sudden, I'm walking out. Hey, who turned off the golf? God. It, just like that, Martin. And I dropped the plate of food because I knew we <sighs> Yeah. After all yeah. those years, I knew yeah, this thing's about to blow up on me again. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so happy I published my book 
because my book I published in uh, early 2009, public Library of Congress, just in case this story ever became public. That yeah, and you know the other the other yeah the other the other argument was the uh, the point seven eight seconds or whatever it was that this thing dropped. Um, that was in your book, and your book was a fiction. And you know, just I just wanted you to follow up on the, the thoughts of that. Was that a a number that you actually saw at some point and recorded? Yeah, the, the next morning I got up. Uh, I was going to do an after action message report on this. I didn't know if the captain would release it or not. But I was going to go ahead and draft it, wrap it up the chain of command so we could get it off the ship, right? Yeah. So I went up there. I was going to review all of our radar, all of our data because we record all that stuff so I could write an accurate report well the tech kind of looks at me um gary Voorhees and another gentleman hasn't come out quite all the way yet and they said um the data is gone kevin i'm, I'm, I'm like what i i, I want to write a report and uh um the other tech kind of winks at me he says i all i did to say i wasn't supposed to but i say this because i wanted to show you we had recorded that intercept on uh cooperative engagement capability. We call it CEC for short. And uh, I had watched the thing the, the, the day before go from 28,000 surface in a second or so. But when I watched the recording, the data displayed actually said 0.78 seconds. That's how long the maneuver took. That's where that number came from. I see. All right. Well, I'm going to show this uh, clip uh, to Mick and get his feedback on it. And uh, but thank you so much. I uh, I really it's always nice. It's always fun talk, talking to you, Kevin. And uh, take care of yourself and hope to talk soon. Me too. Let's do this again for too long. I got some cool stuff coming up right on the horizon, just so you know. Oh, excellent. All right. We'll be in touch. So that's it. So uh, you heard what he had to say. And just I just wanted to know your your feedback. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I don't think everyone, anyone's ever really doubted that people saw things on the radar that appeared to be moving impossibly fast. Uh, so I think that's something that's actually happened and it's something I've always assumed has happened. And so asking like whether it was from 28,000 feet or 80,000 feet uh, in, in less than a second is kind of irrelevant because either way it's an impossibly fast thing. And mm -hmm. the argument there has always been not that it's never happened, but the argument has been that this is some kind of radar glitch. And this is actually the explanation that Kevin himself believed right up until the time of Fravor's encounter. He thought that what he was seeing, and this is something he said on several occasions, that's right, uh, was either some civilian thing, he said, which doesn't really make any sense, or it was uh, something wrong with the radar, some kind of false track. And this is, this is what I think it is. I think it is some kind of false track with the radar. I think uh, there's evidence that there was a, a big systems upgrade uh, that had happened a few days before that, and that might have introduced new problems into the system. So I think that would be my number one hypothesis for that. The reason I brought up the discrepancy between the 80,000 feet and the uh, 28,000 feet was really because um, Robert Powell of the SCU, you know, he has this re report, the SCU report on the, the encounter, and he uses the 80,000 foot figure. And Kevin, as you just heard, uh, used the 28,000 feet figure for the, the 0 0.78 seconds. And so they're using different figures. And yet, uh, Robert, in his report, cites the, the high degree of uh, competence of the witnesses and the accuracy of, of what they said. And yet he's using uh, a 80,000 foot figure, whereas Kevin himself used 28,000 feet for the 0 0.78 seconds. Uh, in addition, Robert made the, the, the point that you know, 80,000 feet is out of the airspace, so they wouldn't worry about it, which doesn't really make sense to me either. Like if there are enemy bogeys going overhead at 80,000 feet over the, the squadron, why is that somehow not important? Uh, it doesn't really make any sense when you think about you know, an active military exercise, a training exercise going on, and there are these targets just flying overhead. It doesn't really matter if they're at 80,000 feet or 28,000 feet. But Robert thought that uh, 80,000 feet was a more sensible figure because the, 
the planes wouldn't collide with these things because they would be at a lower altitude. And so it was only when the, the object dropped from 80 to 28,000 feet uh, that the alarm was raised. However, that's you know really not the story that Kevin's told before. Uh, and I think in, in previous tellings of the story, he's been fairly consistent with it being at 28,000 feet uh, all the time. Like the initial contacts were at 28,000 feet when he first saw them off the coast of Catalina. And they move south down uh, down the screen due south in in formations of five. Well, uh, I just I just want to I just want to uh, stop you right there for a second. We we're kind of running out of time here because I know a lot of people want to call in. Well, hopefully they're they're saying they will anyway. <laughs> but uh, the radar it wasn't just right. Yes, you know, we're talking. There was a lot of radar sources. We're talking the Hawkeye, the Princeton, and the Nimitz plus the aircraft. Right. Uh, we, we're not really, I, I don't, I don't really see these. these Are you talking about the things when they're at 80,000 feet? Is that what you mean? I'm talking about when they're moving south in formations of five from Catalina down to Guadalupe Island at either 28,000 or 80,000 feet, depending on which version of the story there is. This is basically just what's being reported by the spy one radar system. All right. So, um, moving on from that part though, what about the F-18 theory and your yeah, theory that, that theory that's that's a very good point so they raised it you know obviously they would know if there was a, another plane out there because they would they would have, be able to detect it and they, they they broadcast their position especially in an exercise but what i'm suggesting is that essentially they're looking in the wrong place it's a bit like the chilean navy case there's a chase with the, the chilean navy ufo case yeah they saw something off in the distance and they, they they looked on the radar and they couldn't see anything on the radar but the problem was they were looking in the wrong position on the radar and the actual thing they were looking at with the camera was further away. And the real key to this issue is that all I am talking about for the F-18 is that it's the thing on the video. Nothing else. Nothing on the radar or anything like that. None of, none of the other contacts. They would have detected it being an F-18. And I think the thing that, he, that Underwood saw on the video just simply didn't line up with anything because he just happened to be pointing his camera in a particular direction that just happened to line up with one of the other F-A-18s. Uh, that was out there and the track uh, part of it you know you talk about you know that would it ping the the pilot in the other plane and would he like immediately take evasive action no he wouldn't because the only thing that's tracking him at that point is the visual system of the atflia there's those those bars that you see around it that mm-hmm. means it's a visual track it's trying to just keep that dot centered in the middle of the screen and it's only doing that via a feedback loop with the, with the video it doesn't have any kind of radar or other uh, type of lock on the plane, so the plane wouldn't know it was being tracked. Yeah, some someone wanted me to ask you a question. They said, uh, "What qual- what qualifies you to interpret avian uh, avionics data?" Nothing at all. I have no qualifications that are relevant. But I'm just pointing out things that people can check for themselves. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, the Nimitz has. There's a lot. You know, we don't really have any time, but there is a lot going on there um, besides the video. You know, I mean, there's there's just so many different things. And, and uh, Commander Fravor, uh, you know, the uh, the unidentified woman uh, pilot, and I think it was her first mission. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a lot going on there. And, and I feel like there's still a lot to that case. I, I feel like you know, maybe you and I won't agree on this one, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, I will ha- definitely have you back when you uh, when you do uh, the work you are doing. And I think it's always good for anyone in the UFO community to take a look at uh, not just one side of things, and maybe there is another side to a lot of what we see. So thank you so much. I appreciate you being on. And uh, metabunk.com, right, is your website. Metabunk.org. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Dot org. Very good. All right. And I'll link that in the show notes. And thanks so much, Mick. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Okay, everyone. So we are ready to start the the show for the call-in show. Hang on. I got to prepare for that. We'll be right back.
Well, here we are. Bill, how you doing? And hopefully we'll get some callers to call in. Yeah, were you muted? You were muted. Yes, I was because I was paying attention to your interviews. And I got to say, the, the folks in chat, great comments. I was watching it as uh, yeah. you were doing that. Also, it's great to see David Altman in chat. Oh, he's, he's in there quite often. Yeah, yeah. great guy. Yeah. But the thing, I will just touch on this before the calls come because then I got to scram. The thing that I'm waiting for, everybody can speculate all they want. I mean, we're going to hear it from all sides. There's a caller coming in now. But before we, I get to that caller, I'm waiting, and I'm not waiting with, I'm not holding my breath for this 180-day report. Yeah. Because it's all about the the advanced, you know, the aerial threat situation. Do you think now, it's going to, do you think it's it's going to be delayed? I think. It's going to be delayed. But here's the thing. Even if it comes out, there's a classified annex in it. A lot of the stuff that's going to be, I would say, of real vital importance as far as national security is going to be included in that. The only way to get to this is if they hold hearings, which most of them are going to be behind doors, bring all these pilots and people that witness um, whatever they have uh, experienced, get them and put them under oath, along with all the video that they have access to that the public doesn't, and, and really try to get a bearing on exactly what's going on. All the speculation is noise, uh, Martin. From you know, it doesn't matter which side you come from. We need to get to the bottom of what's really going on, and I, unfortunately, I don't think the public's going to get those answers because it's going to be under a classified setting, unless somebody comes out and leaks. You know how that happens, whistleblowers, whatever. But are you? Do you think that we're going to get much out of this 180? Honestly, um, well, it'll be interesting, and I, I really think you know what I talked about with uh, Mick West. This particular video really bothers me. Um, and that is because I, you know, when my scientist brother-in-law contacts me all excited and I have to tell him, I don't think it's a UFO. I think it's I explainable. Um, it just, it, it, it upsets me because I, I think it's, it's just going to hurt credibility. It's not a good thing. Um, a lot of people are big fans of Jeremy. Um, and I'm sorry if someone puts something out that's wrong and publicize it. And George Knapp was behind this. I do believe, and maybe even James Fox. And I, I just hope that they take a better look. Um, and, and if, if, if they don't, you know, I don't really know for sure, but still. Here's, uh, here's another thing. Here's another thing. What the UFO community, they always go out on a limb. Well, not all everyone, you know, yeah. there are those that go out on a limb. They get all excited. Turns out to be nothing. And then they are embarrassed, and it really, it really does a lot of, I would say, superficial damage to the whole community because they're putting themselves out there and saying, "This is a UFO. This is the one. It's the smoking gun." No, it's not. It usually has a rational explanation behind it. As far yeah. as the Tic Tac, I mean, I've spoken to Kevin Day, Gary, some of the other players. I, I I believe them a hundred percent. I do. Just yeah. And, and I don't. I don't. I don't care for M Mick West's um, but, ideas on the Nimitz at all. I mean, I don't. I don't, I don't that, buy any of them. But but despite that, these they did they did witness something that day. There sure. were individuals that came on board, took everything off the ship. I mean, a lot of things did happen. Yeah. And then that, I know uh, in, in chat, you know, a lot of people did mention that Fravor said this didn't happen and it was BS and all that. And, you know, uh, this is, I asked Kevin Day what he thought about Fravor's comments. And he said, well, I, I respect him. He's a captain. He won't say anything negative. I mean, Kevin Day's, a, 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 I guess that's a military training, what, what it does to, but um, he won't, he wouldn't speak against uh, Fravor, even though Fravor said all that. But um, do you, are you missing calls? Are we missing calls? I missed two. So I'm going to go bye-bye, but I'll tell you, <laughs> I yeah. do have a, a song. Wait a minute. We should just tell the people they can call in now and you'll catch the call this time, right? Yeah. 855 yeah. But one more thing. I have yeah. a Sony A7S three camera. And there are times if I'm out of focus, Martin, you will catch. It looks like anomalies. It does look like you, you're capturing something. Yeah. I'm just saying, based on what I do for my Scott watches. But you know what? It's time for me to leave because they're calling in. So <laughs> All have right. a great show. Everybody call in now. I'm out of here. Okay. All right. Don't go out of here, out of here, but you know. No, no, I'm going to yeah. get my camera off. All right. And uh, I believe you, if you're still on, 
you can just introduce them and I'll bring them in. Um, I know you have to mute to talk to them. Either way you want to do it is fine. So as you see the numbers up there, it's uh, 855-472-5483. And um, I'm kind of excited to talk to uh, people. And, uh, you know, anytime I uh, take on an idea like this, it's either going to work or it's not. So I'm hoping it'll work. And um, But I did fill up the beginning of the show. But um, I do, uh, we do have quite a bit of time. Well, we have an hour and, and 20 minutes or so, somewhere around there. So looking forward to your call. And I'm waiting for Bill to screen this call and we'll be uh, going live. So on the uh, last Saturday, uh, well, you know, I should look in chat too. Last Saturday, I had a lot of fun with uh, Louis, uh, Luis, that is, um, he is in uh, chat or he was earlier, a fun guy. And uh, I've said it before, he, he kind of came out of nowhere. He's really put a lot of energy into this thing and a lot of time. He created a list where you can connect to uh, your representative, no matter what state you are in. It took him an entire week of work to do this on his own time for free, um, just so people can connect um, to the representative and say he has a whole script written out. Um, so if you're talking on the phone, he really doesn't want you to go into your own ideas about UFOs, your own sightings or anything like that. He has it all scripted for you. So it's done in a way that they will listen to you. So anyway, that's the bigphonehome.com and uh, check that out. And let's see, we're going to take, we have four callers on. We're going to take um, Dennis right now from Illinois. Well, welcome to the show, Dennis. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for the call. Yeah. First of all, I totally agree with you on the Nimitz case. There's, there's too many sightings and what he's doing is like most people that deny it. They pick one thing and hang on that and they don't go beyond that. Um, so yeah. I totally agree with you. But one of the reasons I wanted to call in is I got an answer to a question you've asked a bunch of times. Oh, good. You took, you talk about the Roswell case and why they came up and said they recovered a disc and then said, no, 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 we didn't. All right. The best place to hide a lie is in the truth. And the best place to hide the truth is in a lie. They had a lot of witnesses. They landed near Corona. The fire department was there. The sheriff's department, all kinds of people were there. The Lieutenant from uh, Roswell, that gave the news release. He had a very, very high respect for Blanchard. Blanchard had saved his life. Hmm. He was told by Blanchard never to talk about it. But what he did do was after Blanchard died, he met with his attorney and a court reporter and he gave a statement that was supposed to be released after he died and was released after he passed away. In the statement, he talks about the fact that one day there was a meeting with Blanchard and General uh, Tippett and several other officers discussing how they were going to conceal the fact they recovered the disc. The next day when he came in, there was a note on his desk that he was to personally release the information that they had recovered a disc. By doing that, if any of the witnesses ever did talk, the military can come back and say, oh, wait a minute. We were mistaken, too. They're mistaken. They don't know what they're talking about. We made the same mistake they made. So so you, you kind of think that this was sort of a, a disinformation situation? Is that is that what I'm getting out of all this? Yes, absolutely. The best in you get. You remember, you had landed near Corona. So you had the fire department, the sheriff's department, civilians. You had a, a surveyor out there. You had three guys collecting rocks that were out there. You had some college students and a college professor, and then mm. all the military. That, that's sort of not 100% on the college professor and, and, and the geologist team. That's kind of a thing that's kind of up in the air. But one, one thing, let me just ask you this part of that. Um, when this first happened, there was Max Braswell, I want to say. Uh, I believe that's yeah. his name. And he came into town and he basically started talking about it. But 
um, it was it wasn't immediate that all these people ran out to this site, wasn't it? Didn't it take a while? It was sixty miles away or so from Roswell, right? Well, the the, the crash that went down where he was his his farm or his ranch was away from Roswell, but where the craft actually went down was closer to Corona. So mm. it was easy for the people from Corona to go out there. That was where the problem was. Um, you, so you had the civilians there and then any military that was involved in picking the stuff up, you've got them involved in it. So you had a lot of people that could talk. Now, fortunately for the Air Force, nobody did talk until years later. Unfortunately, when people did talk, they believed them. But um, that that's why they did it that way. It was a matter of just uh, disinformation to cover up what happened. Hmm. Wow. Well, I appreciate that. Any other, we have, uh, we have, uh, I think we have four more people on the line. So, uh, um, yeah, we'll probably move along. Dennis, thank you so much for your call. I love your show. Thank you. Bye. All right. I appreciate that. All right. Take care. All right. Next we have, well, Bill, you said carries, but I'm going to say that it's probably carry right on line two. You're correct. Carrie. And I'm from a special, yeah, I'm from a special place for you. I believe San Rafael, California. Uh, but, you know, hey, yeah. Have you, are you, have you and I talked before? No, I sent you an email a couple of times. Oh yeah. Bill yeah. Burns on and some stuff like that. And if you knew anything about the uh, Gray Barker and Albert K. Bender connection. That's right. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You live in a, he lives in a town where I actually lived uh, for, I don't know, two or two or three years. And I worked a, uh, I thought about taking over an auction gallery there in the San Rafael auction gallery, which still exists today. So yeah, right on Irwin street there. It's beautiful, uh, beautiful place to be beautiful weather out there. Very nice. Uh, so welcome. Do you have anything in particular you want to talk about tonight, Carrie? Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I kind of thought, um, I had this one incident happen that was kind of leaves me really perplexed. Uh, this happened back on September 13th. I believe it was 2-11, right after 9-11, when nothing was flying. And I live over here in back of a ball field, and it has light towers. I'm looking at it right now, maybe 50 feet. I was mm -hmm. going out that night, to get, right about dusk time, getting a little bit dusky. Oh, well, I was actually getting on the night side of dusk. And uh, <clears throat> I glance up, and I see this white dome light and this red light on a structure on top of something black floating about four times the height of the lamppost over the field. Mm -hmm. And um, as I had mentioned a long time ago, I'm not real happy about these things because I think there's some good ones and some bad ones. And, uh, but I watched this thing and you could see it was solid because as it moved, the lights on top of it disappeared. And mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of floated over. And to this day, it's like, is that a good time for some military thing to be up in the air or is it just something that, you know, it leaves me scratching to see if there's any direction of which way to interpret it. Um, no noise as usual, you know, just what you hear, that. Yeah. black, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the lights underneath. It had the lights on top and it was on the leading end because it disappeared as the angle changed. And, um, uh, I see. How far would you say you were from it? Exactly. Approximately. I mean, uh, I would say about 125 feet, something like that. Ooh, 100 pretty close. You look up and see it float overhead. Yeah. And any, uh, um, I know you said no sound, but um, was Not there any type Floating. of vibration or anything? Did you feel any type of uh, energy or any, you know, you hear a lot of different things. So that, that's why I'm asking these questions. No, no. Yeah, right. There's no, no vibration, no sound, no smell, no sensations at all. It just floated. It was dark. And I know that they had talked about one time the military investigating like balloons again, you know, and that would be floating, but there was no noise of propulsion. It was nothing sound, nothing audible. So I you know, just like. And, and how did you feel? Were you, did you feel scared? Did you feel curious, uh, anxious, any, any, oh. anything like that? I'm really kind of terrified of these things. Uh, well, like I say now, I've kind of uh, adapted to the fact that there are good ones and that there are bad ones. So I appeal to the good ones. 
<laughs> you know, but I didn't know. So it's like, you know, but they have that kind of standoffishness to it. Mm. And, uh, you know, but it, it was a perfect time for a military operation, you know, mm. but at the same time, I don't know, you know, maybe the Aurora project and, you know, the black triangles, you hear about it. I, you know, and I just kind of wonder, does this indicate anything in any direction in trying to solve this phenomena problem or issue? Did you, did you report it ever? Did you ever report it? Uh, I reported it to Newfork. Oh, okay. And, but, yeah. but I didn't have a camera with me at the time or anything like that. You, and like everybody says, you just don't think about it. You look up there and then you find gold in your mind. You know, the thing they talk about, what I was trying to notice, I don't know if it made a difference if it was too far away, but when you talk about the source of light on some of these things, it's not regular light, you know, because I didn't see anything like shining out of this white globe. It was like a cream cover. Maybe it could have been opaque, maybe not, but it was contained inside this, wow. this dome, you know, and you hear about, you know, stuff like that with UFOs and things, you know, and uh, like I say, it's just very perplexing and, um, you know, it, does it add to one theory or the next? I have no idea. Right, right. Well, I thank you very much for sharing that. That was uh, very interesting. And, um, you know, it's like, these things can change your life when they happen. I mean, I'm doing a show now because I had a sighting and um, I had no idea myself at the time how to report something like that. And I never, like I've mentioned many times, never thought of the internet. And I mean, right. And one thing a long time ago, I mean, I've been in, I'm an old person, you know, I've been into this since the sixties and all this mm -hmm. stuff happening there. And when I was really into it and one thing that an incident that happened to me when I was a kid, I was hoping to make contact. And, you know, but I was terrified at the time. And uh, anyway, I built this UFO detector at the time that was in some book where it was just basically a compass needle with a wire going to a horn and the wire coming back to two other nails on the other side of the compass needle. So if there's a fluctuation in a magnetic field, it would beep. And I, I built that. this thing and had it in my room for three weeks. And then one night, beep, beep, <laughs> beep. And I just went further under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, something happened and, that time too and you probably got rid of it the next day right <laughs> you got it <laughs> you got it all right Kerry. well hey thanks for the call good to talk to you my pleasure martin thanks right, for the take care I yeah you too all, Bye -bye. all right next we have duncan from from florida i think i know this duncan from email duncan how are you um really good really good the um i'm just getting over the uh the Mick West uh, interview, uh, <laughs> which is pretty depressing. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we're not going to agree on the Nimitz case one, but I have to tell you, I do agree with him. And Mark D'Antonio, I don't know if I, I don't think I mentioned this, but Mark D'Antonio and agrees a hundred percent with Mick on the first video that we talked about. Um, and oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, his, yeah. Um, his take on it um, seemed right on. Un unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the Duncan that sends me email, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. We've. Yeah. Uh, I've sent you a few. In fact, I, I. I. I think it was last week. I. I guess. Yeah. Last week, I, I sent a. Um, a photo that my daughter took of. Oh me. yes. SpaceX yeah. launch, which which was uh, very very cool. I, I was just amazed. You know, we we live in uh, Palm Beach. I was amazed that we actually could see it from here. You know, obviously all the way um, to uh, up into the um, uh, farther north up the coast. So that was that was a, a surprise that uh, we could even get that shot. But it was very it was very cool. I'm going to see if I can pull that up and. Uh... I think I got it here in just a second. It'll be up on the screen if it does uh, show up here. There we go. Uh, so on YouTube, you can see that. Now, what a great image that is. Really, really pretty, actually. Uh, yeah, she was, so Yeah, very happy with that yeah. when, uh, when she emailed it to me that morning. <laughs> That's great. Um, so let's see. So what would you like to talk about? Yeah, well, uh, Something completely different, as uh, Monty Python would often say. Um, I've uh, I've always been intrigued by um, the um, what's going on up in uh, on Mars, and, and of course, Mars is very much in the news uh, these days. Um, 
my interest was really piqued. Um, I'd read the uh, the book by uh, Richard Hoagland and, and Mike Barra, Dark Mission, um, which was I, I would call it almost an expose on NASA and and what they were trying to hide. Um, what was going on, not just on Mars, but even uh, on the moon. And I, I, I just found the uh, the book to be pretty uh, pretty interesting. And um, of course, now that we've got the um, the helicopter um, up on uh, up on Mars, I think Ingenuity, I think they're calling it. I just thought it would be very cool if they uh, set it off and try to take some. Uh, photos of the uh, the Cydonia area, um, where you know it's the supposed face on the uh, on the surface of Mars and that particular um, structure uh, was just for kind of to clear it up um, one way or the other. You know, is it uh, um, is it natural or, or is it some kind of alien artifact? Uh, I just find it that you know that the, the the book. Um, paints a pretty um, intriguing picture of of, uh, of what has been happening over the years with, with you know like a cover up if you like um, I would say that I'm certainly no and I'm certainly not anti uh, NASA by 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 any means uh, living in Florida you know I, we actually go up to the launches quite often and it's something I've Oh, you know, we really enjoy doing, but um, certainly the the book is is pretty int- uh, intriguing, and and I, I and I was bringing it up to you. I I, I don't recall if this, if this was actually a subject you'd ever covered or or you'd brought anybody onto the show. Um, no, I I I was thinking that was pretty much, and I hate to use the word after how we just put uh, Mick West in his little frame, but uh, I'm pretty sure that was debunked and um, that it's a rock formation. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Um, And you can see uh, with the different light casts on it in this particular case, of course, you can only see this on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch, but uh, the light is at an angle. It certainly does look just like a face with eyes, nose, mouth, all that stuff. But then when they took a better image of it, um, if you happen to be looking at YouTube now, you can see it's just a, yeah. a rock yeah. formation, very much looks like the shape of a face and uh, the angles of uh, of these gullies or whatever it is are, are set to look, I mean, they're you know balanced like eyes, they look like eyes. I mean, it just depends on the angle of, of light that, goes across it but i, I do believe that they've uh, figured yeah, out I, that I, I, there's I, not much anything to it yeah um and, and i guess the what i what i found interesting about um the the, the book's version of events is is the the photos that look particularly um well nondescript if you like they they are um in their own way doctored whether they are or they're not, I, I just find the book to be really uh, a, a really interesting take, and, and it's certainly um, yeah. it, it's certainly the a, a conspiracy theory um, for sure. Yeah, excellent, Duncan. It's a real pleasure to talk to you and to meet you on the phone. Yeah, you, you too. Great, great show, Martin. Thanks. Uh, all right, you take care. All right, next we have Ali from LA. Ali. Is it the alley I know, Ali? Yes, uh, I had called earlier. I've called earlier before. Oh, okay. Hey, how are you? Uh, fine, thanks. Uh, I'll stay on topic, and I have my questions written down. Uh, and I have so many questions on the Nimitz, but so I, I, I just had one question. When Kevin Day reported that he heard David Traver say, "I'm engaged, I'm engaged," you know, he said, "Oh my God, I'm engaged." David Trevor has never talked about this, and I, I believe Kevin Day's account on this. It, uh, I was wondering if it's possible to ask Kevin Day at what exact point did he hear David Trevor say this? Hmm. I know that um, he said, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it's called. When the two points connected, um, there's a, what is it called? Morris Blot. 
Yes, at Mark. that point is when when supposedly is when David Fravor said that. Um, but I I don't know um, I don't know any if if Kevin can give any more information any more at this point. You know you you think about it also. This is many years ago, two thousand four. Um, you know times flowing away from that and you know memories tough to be able to try to remember something. I mean, I try to remember something from 2004 and it, it wouldn't be easy. So I'm not sure if he can actually accurately say when he heard that. Understood. I feel that a lot of uh, people haven't asked him. There's so many details that could be, you know, asked about this case. I haven't seen anyone ask. And the reason why I say, because this is a remarkable phrase that and then David Favor hasn't talked about it, so it would, it would be nice, but I guess, uh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, one other thing I had was what can be done to bring Kevin Day, David Traver, and all the others in the Nimitz case in the same room and have a show about it, a talk show, or a Reddit AMA about it. You know, I, I wish they all got together in the same room. That would be nice. I will tell you, David Fravor is very careful with anyone um, that he speaks with. Um, he he tries. I mean, I, I know he spoke spoken with George Knapp. Um, uh, there's uh, several other people. Da uh, Jeremy Corbell was uh, actually the first one, I believe, to speak with him. Um, and then, um, you know, just Joe Rogan and and people like that. But he would have it would have to be a real special event before he would uh, show up and sit in a room, I believe, with other people involved in it. And, um, you know, I don't know uh, if it's uh, if it's just something that would be difficult to do ego wise for him or what. I really don't know. I can't I can't uh, tell how he operates, but I do know that he uh, I have actually tried to reach out to him uh, several times and, and there's never a response. I'm a little guy. So I, and I get that. But um I, I just don't know if he'll ever sit in a room. It would be nice, though. I, I think I think the idea is great, and I would like to see that as well. I just don't know how it could happen and who who would have the uh, ability to put something like that together that he would pay attention to. Yeah, I hope that one day he realizes how important this uh, event is and mm. you know, th there's more that these people can do uh, to appear in a group together and talk to everyone and uh, yeah, I hope he does that one day. Third question I had was, see, uh, some people have said that, you know, from 20,000 feet above, uh, you know, if the Tic Tac is a 40 feet long object, how much would they be able to see from that distance? Uh, or did David Traver have to wait until it came closer up uh, about half a mile away, as he once said? You know, so, so that that's an interesting question as to how much detail was he able to see from 20,000 feet above the ocean when they were all up and the object was near the ocean floor. And then when it came up, how much detail did this see when at that time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hear about the detail, but obviously it was when it was closer to them, you know, with a little antennae, whatever was sticking out. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's a pretty fascinating case. Um, well, hey, I appreciate the call, Ali. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you for calling in. All right. Day. All right. Take care. All right. Next, it looks like we have, is it Luis from California? Uh, this is John, Jonathan. Oh, did I? I think uh, I think we have uh, something in the, the, the order has changed a little bit. I'm sorry. Jonathan, North Carolina. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I have uh, one question. Um, there was also Jerry Mark... Jeremy also released four images of a uh, spherical type craft that would, you know, move through the air and then entered the water without it being destroyed or any debris showing up from a crash. And there's also a similar incident of the Puerto Rico UFO where someone tracked on a flare type of camera of craft yeah. going from the air into the water. Are mm -hmm. you aware of any other incidents with like those similar, similar types of facts? Not really. Those two, um, you know, I've heard, you know, people will talk about the um, the ability to go in and out of different mediums, you know, without any change, which is pretty amazing. I don't understand how 
the physics could possibly work on that. Um, but um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the Puerto Rican one is really fascinating to watch. I've looked at that video quite a bit. I have not looked at what you're talking about that um, Jeremy Corbell uh, may have released. I'd like to see that. I'll look into that more. But um, yeah, I mean, those are really fascinating. And that's one of the things that Lou Elizondo talks about a lot. Um, that's one of the five elements, I think it is, what he says, of what is uh, uh, superior to any uh, technological breakthroughs that we've ever made. Is uh, One of them is uh, going through different mediums um, as they do. So all, all great stuff. Interesting. I was just curious. One last question: uh, Are you? Do you have any knowledge of when the Aerial School documentary might get released? Yeah, I I get that question. I'm going to say I get that question once a week, and I've I let Rand Randall Nickerson. Um, he and I were talking quite a bit, and he's kind of um, kind of gone dark. <laughs> um, he's not returning my text. I texted him uh, twice yesterday, actually, and said, Hey, look, I'm going on my show. You know, as always, I'll do anything I can to help you promote this. Um, and I know that it's ready to come out. I've heard rumors. I don't want to perpetuate those rumors and tell you what I've heard. But all I can tell you is that um, I do believe we're going to be able to watch it this year. To me, that is... Uh, I, I was thinking about this again. I talked earlier about my brother-in-law being uh, talking about uh, he came out actually from Washington state uh, with my sister, of course. And this one particular case uh, after I talked to him about it and John Mack and, and his work he did and everything, I consider it. Um, I used to say it's in the top five cases. I, I think it's more toward number one. It's awful hard for me to commit to number one, but I do believe the Ariel case is probably one of the cases. If there's anyone going to, that's going to, if there's any case that's going to convince some, someone that something is really happening, I do believe that has so many elements in it that are innocent and, and uh, honest that I do believe that is the case that's going to change people's minds. Myself, I think that's such a good one. So we're looking for it. I do believe we're going to see it fairly soon, but I can't tell you the date. Um, and as okay. soon as I hear, as soon as I hear back from Randall Nickerson, um, the moment I do, I'm going to try to get him on to promote the release of this thing as soon as it's ready. Yeah, that was, that'd be great. Cause like I, he did a few interviews last year and I was such a fan of his work. And then, like you said, it went dark. So yeah, yeah. Those his are... work, if anyone just even looks at his, his uh, photography, he's a, extremely fussy in what he does and uh, it should be a wonderful thing um yeah, well, when, when it comes out all right well um i thank you very much for the call and uh bill i have to tell you i'm totally confused at who's next you started texting me different names <laughs> and so darlene thank you darlene you're from louisiana how are you darlene i'm good darling this is darlene darlene Darlene, oh dear, I that was Darlene. my fault. And I, but I said Louisiana, right? Didn't I sort of? Yeah, you said it right. Yeah. How are you? Welcome to the show. I'm well, thank you. All right. What do you have to say today? Oh, I got a few things to say today. Um, I like. Uh, I actually like when you have a debunker on. Hmm. I think that critical thinking is essential. Because mm -hmm. most of the people want to believe so badly, they accept way too much junk. And it is bad, very bad, because, you know, not everything, not everything is a UFO. That's right. And I've actually seen one up close, so, <clears throat> which affected me all of my life. Would you and like to talk about that? Sure, it, it doesn't bother me. I'll talk about that. All right, let's hear it. Well, um, it was 1993, and you talk about memory. Um, 1993, 1994. I went up to a friend's house to help him pack up his wife's belongings for his children because she suddenly passed away unexpectedly. And they were living on a small parcel of land on a ranch farm 
And the one thing they had that I loved the most was a telescope. And every night we'd go out on the porch and we'd look, we'd pick the planets and we'd look at planets and we'd plot satellites and, you know, just look at the stars and, and the planets and just, wow, you know. And one night we were looking at Saturn. And I was in awe. I saw the rings for the first time in my life, and I was in awe. Mm. And then this thing came into view. And it it was glowing. And it looked like it was coming towards us. And I'm almost like, oh, cool. An asteroid. A me- it's going to be, you know, a meteorite or something, you know? So I, my friend Ron, I said, hey, Ron, take a look. I think we got a meteorite, an asteroid, a small asteroid coming this way, you know, Take a look in the telescope. And he walks over and he takes a look in the telescope and he stands up, turns white, and looks at me and goes, that's not an asteroid. This thing came down. We were on the back deck. It came down. It was completely silent. I think it was about, if my memory serves me, anywhere from 60 to 70 feet long. It glowed red and orange it was completely silent and it was no more than about 40 to 50 yards away from us so are you saying you track this through the telescope first or were you just looking up all the way down yes and when it, it how do i put this you could we couldn't look away but we were terrified it was a sense of terror and excitement at the same time because we could not explain what we were looking at. And it hovered, silent. It was bright, but it didn't hurt your eyes. Hmm. And dear God, the fear, but the excitement, it was just transforming. So all of a sudden it just picks up and takes off down into the pasture. Right when that happened, First, the military helicopters, and then you could hear the jets going in the same direction of this object. And I actually saw the helicopters because it, it, they blew over our house. It was, I'm from a military family from World War I to, to today. So I can identify military. The, the, they, were, they were Black Hawk. And they took off in the direction of this object. And then we heard the jets. By this time, we were mystified, terrified, and a bunch of things. And I think we even soiled ourselves. Got into the car and drove to the nearest place in this little town that was open where there were other people, which was Waffle House. Sat and there all night long trying to figure out what we just experienced. Um, We weren't abducted. Uh, We didn't get radiation burns or anything like that. We didn't have any fantastical thing happen. But to this day, I cannot explain the experience of what we saw. And I'd love to see it again. I have a telescope. <laughs> um, I'm not afraid. I mean, if it wanted the, if it is uh, a, from out of space, or if it's ours or whatever, they didn't harm us. They didn't hurt us. So I'm not terrified of it. And I critical think through everything. I'm, I'm partially educated. So when I see videos, say, from Chile, they're almost at the bottom of the world. And you see these orange things flying in the sky, the back of it. They shoot a lot of rockets from China and everything. And when, Or it could even be the space shuttle. Yeah, you, you, you get the bottom. So the Earth is spinning and these rockets go around and, and they orbit the Earth. And you can actually see the afterburn of these things. And if you check, if you check online, you can actually find. So, so videos like that real easy to debunk. And people like Mick West will debunk one thing and then he thinks he's an authority on everything else. So you just take 
the one thing that he's right about and you throw away the rest. And mm-hmm. I just want to say I, I watch you and, and, and a few other guys, um, the rest of them, like Jer- Jeremy Corbell. I've watched some of his stuff, but quite frankly, I look at him as fictional. He does really good fiction for me, good mm-hmm. science fiction. And I just don't pay any attention to him. When I was younger, I paid attention to Mr. Knapp. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, he's lost it a bit for me, and I don't have much respect for his work anymore. I just put it in the fiction column. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, well, memory of a yes. particular event was life-altering. All right. Wow. Well, thank you so much. We have a, a lot of people on the lines. Thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate it, Darlene. You're welcome. All right. Take care. All right, next we have Drew from Salt Lake City. How are you, Drew? Good. How are you, Martin? Good. Good. Thanks for the call. I saw I saw okay. the best lightning storm I ever saw in my life. Um, right out right on the Salt Lake, right on to the mountains. It was great. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a really cool area. Um sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh but I have a, a crazy experience I'd like to tell sure. you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's almost been about 10 years since this has uh, happened. And uh, there's a small canyon by where I grew up. Um, it's by the Ochre Mountains here in Salt Lake City. Uh, and me and four friends were uh, late out at night up in a canyon just walking around trying to kill the time and uh, a star fell from the sky. It it looked just like a a normal star. It looked just like every other star in the sky and it fell into the Canyon and it shot around this Canyon uh, Mm -hmm. like a pinball um, sort of flashing colors um and we all just lost our minds <laughs> we uh we were just swearing nonstop and i uh, like screaming basically it was it was just so exciting um yeah how, and it, how many uh, people were with you four people were with me mm-hmm. um sorry no no go ahead i want to hear how this progressed and 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 what you did after and how you felt and all that stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, it, I still kind of get excited bringing up now. Uh, it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, not to mention being on the show, but, uh, eventually the, it stopped shooting around this Canyon. It it was like a, like a pinball or something. It it moved Mm -hmm. like that. It would just sort of really quickly shoot around the sky and, uh, like sequence colors. It, I, hmm. I can't remember the colors, but it was, it would go in pattern. Um, and it eventually stopped and just stayed at one spot in the sky. Um, and you, you know, it's after midnight, we were, we were all, <laughs> I, I mean, it's dark in this Canyon. Um, and the light, when it stopped, it stopped sequencing the colors. It just stayed white in the sky um and then the light turned off and when the light turned off we all got really scared Uh, like it was really strange we we were like just abnormally scared (laughs) um and i you know i've become obsessed with ufo stuff after this happened to me um and there was a a fog that literally came out of nowhere and we were all in this fog terrified and wow. you know, basically ran back to our car and drove home and nobody, we didn't like say a word or anything. We were all just, you know, completely amazed uh, and terrified at the same time. It was, it was literally terrifying, but I, I don't know. Yeah. That's basically the story. That is, uh, well, I got to tell you, that's on one 
like I've never heard before. Um, you I had, have. and, and did, w when you say this thing stopped, did it stop like, and just stay for a certain amount of time? And then eventually did you see this thing take off? Um, I didn't see it take off. It basically it stopped. And when it stopped moving, it stayed a, a white light just dead in the center of this valley, uh, you know, st still. And then when the light turned off, the contrast like of our eyes, just it was just impossible to see anything. And, you know, I like I've thought about it a lot since then. I, I listen to your show all the time. Uh, and, you know, there was no. I couldn't see any structure to the behind the light or anything. It was just a, a light. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the fog really was something that still gives me like chills to this day because it, we were so scared. It was just really unreal. Now, is that, is the fog you're talking about? First of all, did it happen near where you are in Salt Lake City or did it happen in another location? No, it, it was, this all happened at the same time. It was all it, the same incident. I, I mean, this, this canyon is a little bit outside of the city. I, I mean, it's the Ochre Mountains are, Salt Lake Valley has got the Wasatch and the Ochre Mountains on either side of it. Um, mm. it and so I live kind of at the peripheral of, or I did live there, uh, of Salt Lake City out by the Ochre Mountains. If anyone lives here, will know what I'm talking about. Um, and there's just a little canyon there called Butterfield Canyon, which is where this, this happened. Um, and yeah. I, well, okay, <laughs> but the fog, the fog it, it seems like it would be unusual to begin with out there, unless I'm wrong. Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole thing was unusual, uh, and the fog came from nowhere. It literally just appeared, and I mean, we were, I was so scared, you know, nobody said a word. We just, I was looking at them to see if anyone would start running. That's how afraid I was. And did you ever report this in any type of way? I, no, <laughs> no. Uh -huh. And how about you now? Will you talk to your four, uh, three other or four of whoever the other people were? Do you discuss this often? I mean, it, I was young then. Mm -hmm. I, I still stay in touch with these people. And, uh, you know, I could get a hold of them, but I don't talk to them regularly. It was, you know, sort of, I was just out of high school at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is quite a story. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry All right. for being so nervous. Oh, no, no. Couldn't even tell. Nice to talk to you, really. It was great. Thanks. All right, you All right Drew. Take care. You too. All right. Next, we have uh, Rob. Rob from uh, Rob from Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for having the show. Yeah. Um, I'm I've having got, fun. I've got some stories. Uh, I could tell you some stories. Uh, I can tell you one or more. But, uh, yeah, well, right now it looks like uh, I think the phone lines, I think we went through all those seven people. I think we uh, we have open lines if people want to call in. Again, that number's up on the screen, but it's 855-472-5483. So, yeah, let's let's uh, let's start out with one and we'll go from there. All right. Well, my uh, my first one was about uh, either the late 1989 or early 1990. I was living in Oakland, California, um, and one evening I went out and uh, just was walking around looking at the, the city, whatever I could see, um, and uh, I was in a, an area that was kind of high in Oakland. I could see around pretty well. The and Oakland that, Hills? I, I used to work out there in Oakland. So Oakland Hills? Oh, there's a place called China. I think it's called China Hill. Mm -hmm. It's not, not real far from Merritt Lake. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was that area. There Walked was a, around there a few times. Like a, yeah. A, there was a bridge you could go over the eight-lane highway or whatever it was there. Mm -hmm. it was go down to Park Avenue, Park Avenue or something. There's a theater and stuff there. Anyway, uh, 
So I was looking around, looking at the sky, and uh, I noticed there were these two dim reddish lights. They weren't blinking. Um, from the way they were moving somewhat rather slowly, they appeared to be attached to something. Um, because of how far apart they were, my thought was, well, it's either further away and not very loud and big, or it's closer and it's very quiet and silent and really big. Um, but oddly enough, it didn't, um, it didn't like, uh, disturb me. It didn't surprise me or something. I, I just didn't know what it was. And I continued looking around a bit. And as it moved, um, as I looked, when I looked back up, it had moved off further away. It was, uh, probably over the hills. Like uh, there's that, the hills on the, uh, the east side of Oakland. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it kind of just lost track of it. It was, it was kind of dark enough and hazy enough that I, I never saw anything other, anything about that thing other than there were two lights on it that were very dim um, and moved together. Um, it, it never stopped. Um, uh, it did turn and change direction, but it didn't, um, didn't seem to change its speed at all while I was watching. And again, it didn't impress me hardly at all. I actually, I didn't mention that to anyone for, 20 years or more, I think it just wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't impressive. Um, so that was, there's that story. And I, the one thing about that is the, the lights, they weren't very bright. Um, I just thought that was odd. Um, were they, um, a lot of people will talk about lights that are different than normal lights. Do you feel that that was it as far as the color and, and the glow and all that, or was it just, uh, nothing really that, um, what you could differ differentiate between any other lights? As I remember it, they, they didn't. It wasn't a point light, like most lights on aircraft or uh, I think they're running lights. They're points of light that blink or they stay on. Um, these were lar somehow larger. It was like a, a little area of the what might have been a wing that was glowing. And again, it was dim. It wasn't. Uh, it, it was it wasn't impossible to see, or it wasn't hard to see, but it wasn't bright. That's mm. what I remember. And it was a, like a very like burgundy color, red. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Um, so you said we have more more stories. Yeah. I, we still have time if you'd like to uh, like to share sure. some more. Yeah. And uh, just but off of that one experience, I, I understand why most people don't report what they see. It's just it doesn't impress them, and maybe they're busy doing other stuff. So, um, so the other one, the next time I saw something unusual was uh, 1996. Um, I was in a place called Indiana, Pennsylvania, and um, I think it was May or. April or May, um, I remember it was uh, after midnight and it was cold, about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I was taking pictures of a comet called Haikutake. It had come around then in 1996. Um, and although the, the seeing wasn't very good, it was a bit hazy. Um, and uh, at times uh, I couldn't see the the dimmer stars because I was in, I was in the town um, with other lights around. Um, I was still trying to take pictures of it. I just had a chair next to me and my camera, my 35 millimeter camera on a little tripod with a uh, stop cable on it. Um, and I, I'd been out there for a while and I, and I noticed these um, lights moving from roughly south to north over the city. Um, and they, Again, they were not normal lights. Um, they were apparently oval, and they were arranged in a perfect triangle, with the uh, with one light leading and the other two behind. Um, it moved in a constant at a constant speed in a straight line, and it was fairly high up. I, I'd say it was about forty five degree angle or a little lower. Um, pretty high up. Um, and I, I looked at it, of course, 
didn't think about using my camera at all. Um, partly because it's, you know, I had it set on certain settings so that would take me time to flip through them to change it. Um, and then about 20 minutes later, I was looking at the sky, checking things, and this time east to west, much lower, probably about 60 feet off the ground, whatever these were came over top at a constant speed, didn't stop. Um, moving, I would guess, at about the same speed as a bird, maybe a little faster, but I, I couldn't hear any wings. I couldn't hear any bird calls. Um, and this time, although there were only two of them, one was riding behind the other, like offset, as if it were part of a triangle. But I only saw two this time. And they were low enough that I, I could see that they were ovals. Uh, it reminded me of a street light as it was coming on, but dim. They were very dim. Um, the, uh, the light was uh, uniform over the oval. There wasn't any indication that it was light from the street lights hitting it on one side and not the other. Um, the light itself wasn't all the same. It, it seemed as if they were modeled, like there were some patches that were even dimmer than the other areas around it, and it was uni like uniformly modeled all through it. Um, and they both just moved over top, heading, actually it was west to east, yeah, west to east. And uh, it just went in a straight line over the houses, just down the... Uh, down the neighborhood and I lost sight of them. Uh, no sound, perfectly silent. And, and when that happened, I, uh, I thought, I think it's time to go in. So, uh, yeah, I just, I got a little bit spooked from that, but I wasn't yeah. really terrified. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, we all of a sudden, we all of a sudden get a bunch of calls. So, all right. Thank you. I really appreciate the You're call. Welcome. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Martin. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Uh, Bill, I think I'm a little confused at who is on. Um, it looks like someone wants to be called UAP. Well, I guess we'll start there uh, from the East Coast. Wow. How anonymous. You know, if you give your first name and you're from the East Coast or even from a city or town or state, uh, I think that's pretty anonymous. Uh, I'm wondering if I should worry about this caller. UAP, are you there? Yeah, no, I'm here. How are you? Is it Good. How about you can you can even lie and make up a first name? <laughs> yeah, Much my name's Ralph. I'm from the East okay. Coast. All right. Hey, how you doing? Uh, good, good. No, I just wanted to call in. I, I kind of came in at the end of the show, and I'm not really sure what kind of people have shared. I just caught, like, the last two callers, and uh, I just figured I'd call in and uh, share my experience. And uh, just bear with me. It's it's not really a story that I've I've told very often. Uh, it happened back in the mid nineties. And, uh, I really, I didn't tell anybody for 20 years. Uh, the first person I told was my wife and I've, I've since told a few people, close family members. Um, but in the, uh, the mid nineties on, uh, the East coast one night, just after dark, uh, really no more light left in the sky. Uh, I walked outside. I was, uh, I was about 12 years old. I was pretty young. And I walked outside to get something from the front yard. And as I was walking back uh, towards the house, um, I, I, I think I heard it first, really. Uh, it was a low hum. And I, I turned around and uh, to my uh, utter shock, um, I saw floating uh, less than 100 feet off of the ground uh, was a large uh, black triangle. Uh, mm -hmm. The kind that you often hear uh, told in uh, stories, you know, the Belgium UFO flap and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was very large. It was uh, about 300 feet per side, um, probably about 40 feet in, in height. And uh, wow. I didn't see I didn't see any lights on it. You know, you often hear at, uh, of lights being on the corners of these things, and and right. I didn't see any lights except for. Uh, one, one light. And, and I often think back on this light probably more than anything when I think of my sighting, but uh, towards the back corner, not on the underside, but on the actual side of the craft, um, you know, the skinny side towards the back, uh, 
corner that was facing me uh, was a red light. And it was uh, very, it wasn't an otherworldly type of light. It was just uh, the typical type of red light that you would see anywhere on earth. Um, it really reminded me of a light that you would see on an airplane. Uh, they tend to blink uh, on and off on an airplane, but this was not blinking. It was just in the steady on position. And uh, I watched it uh, silently hovering, moving at a, a walking pace, I would call it, you know, the pace that you would walk down the uh, sidewalk, mm -hmm. uh, floating over a, a field uh, directly in front of my house. And I watched it for about eight seconds. And uh, being 12 years old, I, I ran into the house to get a flashlight because I was going to, you know, signal this thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't gone uh, but 10 seconds. And when I came out, it was gone. It was no longer there. And certainly uh, for the pace that it would, was moving, it, it should have been in my line of sight for at least a, a minute and a half to two minutes. Yeah. Um, it decided to take off, I guess, right what? at that time. Hmm. Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> well, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. And all, all of a sudden, we have four more on hold right now. So let me ask you a couple of quick questions here. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Where, where the, you saw this, was it a populated area? You said it was like over a field. And was it a rural area? Was it pop, a pop, near a populated sure. area? It it was uh, it's a mildly populated area. I guess uh, the average neighborhood that you would see on television, like the Wonder Years or something, uh, n normal uh, yeah. residential area. There just happened uh, to be a field uh, across the street. I lived on kind of the the uh, the, the side of this development um, on the border of it, and there happened to be a field in. Uh, it was just uh, floating at a very slow pace, you know, across this field, a very mild sighting, uh, but it definitely had an effect uh, on me. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Another thing is there course, many people will say, no, no, and, just, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Many people say they think that these are military and I'm not, I don't agree with that only in a way that, you know, possibly some of them are now, but they've been spotting these same exact things all the way back to the 1970s. And I think if there, our military secretly had something back then that would do what these things do, then um, I just don't think it could be held secret that long. And why wouldn't we use it in uh, warfare, et cetera, um, or traveling or whatever it is. But anyway, is there a military base anywhere Certainly, near? Uh, uh, there, there is, there is a military uh, base within, uh, oh, 60 miles of where I had the sighting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Which may or may yeah, not no, mean I, anything. I do. I, I, yep, absolutely not. And again, uh, <laughs> a craft, certainly it could have been a military craft and it, it could have came from the other side of the country or another country, uh, all conjecture, uh, but certainly good points uh, to make. And I think that the largest point for, for me to make is that if uh, there was you know, if the narrative for the last 25 years had been, you know, we have some uh, military technology and, you know, we can't really tell you what it is and blah, 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 blah. That would be one thing. But for many of us who have had these experiences, the narrative for a long time has been that these these things don't exist. And uh, for many of us, that's not an acceptable answer and nor should that be. Right. Well, I do really appreciate it very much. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting uh, sighting. Thank you. Thank you very much for the call. All right. It looks like we have uh, Tony next in Florida. Tony? Yes. How are you? Hey, Tony. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Good. Good. Thank Just you. to let everyone know, we have four more people on. So we have to, and how much time do we have? We have uh, 20 something min minutes. So, uh, so we'll try to spread it out evenly, five minutes or so per person. So welcome to the show. Do you have something you'd like to share or a question or what would you like to talk sure. about? I mean, um, well, I've been having experiences since childhood. Um, these are conscious, vivid memories. I don't need regression. I have done hip hypnotic regression with Yvonne Smith oh, from yeah. Ciro, um, mm -hmm. to uncover some, some additional details. Um, my question to you is, do you want to focus on the nuts and bolts type, type stuff where I talk about craft that I've seen? up close or do you want to kind of get into how it's i'm i'm just turned 51 in april do you want to get in how 
the transformative aspects um, in my life um, that have uh, become as a result of these experiences that I've had in the direction that I'm going. Well, I think the latter is the most interesting myself, but um, I don't know what every listener wants to hear out there. So I think if you can just okay. quickly touch on what you think you've seen as far as the uh, craft first and then, and then finish off with um, finish off with how it's changed, you know, your views and who you are and all that. Um, at the okay. end of it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've seen, uh, I guess the stereotypical, uh, red orbs or fire orbs as MUFON has called, uh, as they call them, um, uh, fly over my house, um, on multiple occasions. I also saw one fly. Um, I worked for the department of Homeland security for eight years. Um, and this kind of goes in the transformation part of it. I quit my job because um, I got sick and tired of dealing with the double life. I had the one public figure that I had to convey to everybody, but then there was this other part that I only could reveal to my family and friends, um, particularly among Ciro, that have shared these experiences. And, and, I, and I left my job because of that. And I saw one of these objects at my place of work, and it was either a civilian or uh, military, either was either, it was either a 737 or an Erebus 319, 320 that was actually chasing one of these things. And I tried to go through some channels at the FAA, got roadblocked. My hope is one day one of the flight crew makes some type of public statement that they were, they followed one of these things and they'll give the location and I'll be able to corroborate it. Um, mm -hmm. by, yeah, I was a witness on the ground. And then I've seen the last object, which I did uh, file report to New Fork, so you can see it on there. It was filed in November of 2019 um, in St. Johns County. I observed a chevron-shaped um, craft. Um, it moved from the right to the left, so it would have been going from east to west. Um, and at first, I thought it was a flock of birds. And this was in late at night, no clouds out of the sky. It was perfect perfect crystal night skies. And, and this all happened within a matter of seconds. Um, I then was thinking in myself, wow, there's really no birds out of here that fly in a V formation at night. So when they got it, when they got over me, I saw the boomerang shaped craft reveal itself. And I actually was able to look up into, I guess what I would consider the propulsion system because the light emanating from it, it looked at ex look exactly like the starlight up in the sky. And there was like a black concentric ring up into where these uh, lights were embedded underneath the aircraft, equidistant apart, um, you know, three on one side, three on the other, make, shaping a V. Um, and it was completely dead silent. And I'm saying, and this thing was probably more than no more than 25 feet, 2,500 feet up in the air. Um, and the blackness of it, there was no seams. You didn't see any rivets. It was just one solid piece of craft. And I thought, oh my God, that's why these things are able to fly over our cities. Because if you're not looking at the, at the craft the right way, it's going to blend in with the night sky so beautifully. And, and yeah. then I literally watched this thing to dematerialize. Um, first, the, the craft, the structure disappeared. And then I, all I could see was these lights moving away in the distance. And then eventually the lights went out. And um, I, it just, it literally blew me away. I mean, I just, it, it showed me so much about their technology and how far they're, they're ahead of us. Um, That's amazing. But in the term, yeah, in terms of the transformation, like I said, I, I quit my job with DHS because I was leading a double life and I had talked to other officers that had similar experiences. Not not and it just it, it just became difficult for me. Um I, I Well, said I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you this. Um, I, we are so short of time. We have four people on hold yeah. and I I have to cut everyone down. However, I do want to tell you this. When I have another call in show, I'd like to hear more about this part of it. And uh, you're welcome to share again. It's it's really fascinating what you're saying. But uh, I'm Absolutely. sorry, I'm going to have to. Yeah, I totally get it. 
No, sure. no need to apologize. All right. Thank All right. You. Well, you take care. Thanks so much. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Bye now. All right. Now we have Paul next, and I forget where you're from, Paul. Welcome to the show. Florida, Hi. I think, right? I'm, I'm calling from Florida. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Good. Good. So we have to kind of keep it short. We only have like uh, well, four. I'll try, to, I'll try to summarize it as much as, as fast as I can, but it's so accurate that Oh, it's a pleasure, Martin. Thank you. Uh, sure. If you have a if you have a radio, do I hear a radio in the background? You're going to have to. I hear something. No, I'm watching his podcast, and I'm calling from a hard line. Okay. All right. Uh, I I feel like I'm hearing something in the background. Yeah, it's him. Yeah. Can you mute him? Whoever him is. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anyway. Uh, yeah. It's a pleasure to uh, be on your program. Uh, I'm going to you. give you this report as uh, fast as I can because I know you're uh, biting on time right now. This happened the night after the Pascagoula sighting in 1973. Hmm. I know you're familiar with that. Oh, sure. And uh, I was living in coastal Louisiana, about maybe 150 miles to the west of that community in Pascagoula. Um, previous to that, I, I had been following uh, unidentified flying objects for some time since I was a little boy. And I noticed there was a wave or flap coming from the Western United States at that time. And in 1973, it was one of the biggest waves. I don't think there's been a wave that large or flap that large since that time that covered almost the whole southeastern United States. But anyway, the night after the Pascagoula sighting, when Calvin Parker and Mr. Hickson were abducted in Pascagoula, I told my friend, if we go out tonight, and we lived in a small community, so we went way out into the countryside, away from the community lights. There was no uh, street lights. It was n no moon. It was completely dark, but star lit. And we stopped on the side of a cow pasture. And you can imagine this, way out in the countryside, there was a farmhouse way out to the north of us. And we stopped his car. We were on a gravel road. We got out. There was a ditch and a fence. And I looked up and I said, what's that? And there was a red light moving across the sky coming from west to east. All of a sudden, that red, and I mean it was red, it turned emerald green and stopped. And then it started to come down. So I told my friend, let's get in the car, do a U-turn. And the way these cow pastures were made in that countryside it was like a horseshoe so we turned the car around and we went around this gravel road and we came up the other side at that time it was coming down across the road i told my friend go faster he was driving it was like we were hydroplaning on the gravel he was driving so fast he i said break your lights off and on it came across the road and it turned yellow. I mean, a yellow like you couldn't believe. And it, not a sound. And it came across the road and we stopped. It. He said it turned purple. And I didn't see that. He said it looked like something dropped out of it. And he stopped the car. We got out of the car. We were on the side of the road again. There was a fence and a ditch. We were standing in the ditch holding on to the fence. It was no more than 50 yards from us above the cow pasture, and it was pulsating red, green, orange, and you couldn't see the shape of the craft because when the red would go, the orange was there. When the orange would go, the green was there. I mean, it was emerald green and blood red. It was incredible, and there wasn't a breeze. There wasn't a sound. I told my friend right there, I still remember the words, you're looking at something from another world. And to cut it short, it looked like it started to move to the north and it was gone. It was gone like you turned the light off in your bedroom. The next day, I'm in class at a school 
20 miles to the north. I was a college student at that time. I'm sitting in the back of the room getting ready for a class, taking notes, getting my notes ready when some students are talking in the front. And they, all of a sudden, one of them says, did you see that or see and hear about this thing that flew over this town last night without a sound with the orange, green, and red lights? Amazing. Amazing. Wow. What a story, Chad. No, no doubt. And I, I am not a total believer in the extraterrestrial thing. I am telling you this stuff has something to do with interdimensions. Well, it's definitely one of the theories talked about. Chad, I wish I had more time to talk to you. I like your enthusiasm. and uh, a great oh, man, I've been in this since I was a little boy. It's so real, it's beyond real. And yeah. it's time for disclosure. They've, they've hidden so much. They have so much evidence. It's incredible. Well, Chad, thank you so much. That was really, really quite a story. Good to talk to it you. It is a true story. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. All the best. All right. Take care. And keep watching the skies. Yeah, that's right. Keep your eyes to the sky. All right. We got Scott from uh, Florida. Scott, how are you? You there, Scott? Actually, my name is Chad. <laughs> oh, did I get, I think uh, we, we had a little mix up. Uh, either that or there's more okay. Chads than one. Uh, anyway, <laughs> welcome to the show. Okay. Um, so we are short on time. We've only got uh, four minutes left. I think we have another caller on. So uh, let's let's hear what you got. Uh, well, um, I actually uh, I'm from Gulf Breeze, Florida. I'm a machinist, and uh, there's a base on um, out here that a lot of people aren't talking about. It's the Strategic Air Command, and um, it's actually uh, a part of Herbert Field, which is it's separate from uh, Eglin Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people um, don't understand that this place is a extremely uh, active place for these sightings. And um, I've been studying this subject, researching it for twenty eight years now, and. Um, I did not believe in anything, uh, you know, aliens or anything like that. But and my father worked in counterintelligence also. But living out here and seeing the things that I'm seeing, I, I know for sure that either the military has something to do with. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but I mean, I guess there's something we can't explain. You know, um, it's not just uh, nuts and bolts. Um, it's, it's not, it's some kind of weird interdimensional or I, I, I hate to say it, but, um, what, what I actually witnessed, I can actually say, I don't, I don't work out there anymore, but, uh, um, the first thing I saw was, uh, <laughs> it's a, a, these giant, huge spears that are, uh, they hover, uh, over the base and, um, they actually scramble them, uh, scramble jets after them and try to chase them away. And I don't know if you, a lot of people don't even talk about strategic air command and uh, they don't talk about what goes on there. It's a test site. There's actually a place, um, uh, uh, Hagelin Air Force Base is, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rushing. I'm trying to fit in a couple minutes. Yeah, we're, uh, we anyway. just have like one minute left. I'm, unfortunately, we can't take any more callers, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to wrap this up though. Okay. All right. Well, basically what I'm trying to say is, um, I'll just go ahead and say it, that there's something going on and, uh, you know, I'm still under a, a security clearance, so I can't really say, but basically there's going to be disclosure pretty soon. I mean, I, I, if you want to see UFOs or something's not from, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's a planet or whatever, but you go to Gulf Breeze, Florida and just look up. <laughs> Because they're yeah, here, well, and it's, it's really difficult. Certainly has quite a, a reputation, that's for sure. But anyway, I really appreciate it. Right. Um, thank you so much. And we are right at the end of the show. And so I want to thank everyone for uh, watching, listening. And remember, if you are listening and you want to jump over and look at the video, uh, just go to the show notes. It's it's uh, all in there, that video that explains um, the uh, the what they call the pyramid UFO 
uh, which I do not think holds any weight. I still feel that way. I don't think my mind will change in that. But um, if someone shows me evidence to the contrary, I will look at it, of course. Next week on the premiere of the History Channel's Secret uh, Skinwalker Ranch, we have Travis Taylor and Brandon Fugel, the owner of the ranch. They will both be on. And the main guest is Mark Fiorn Fiorentino. Uh, I believe that's how you, Master of Reality is the book he wrote. And uh, anyway, thank you all so much. It's been a lot of fun. We're going to have more of these. I think it was a success. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.